Hi everyone and welcome to my talk with the title Call Me Maybe Eavesdropping Encrypted LTE Calls with Revolte. I'm David Ruprecht and my co-authors are Katharina Kohls, Thorsten Holz and Christina Pepper. Over 250 operators use voice over LTE worldwide and voice over LTE is thereby the de facto standard for voice calls in LTE networks. Using voice over LTE has many advantages for providers and users. Voice over LTE have a low call setup time, a better voice quality um, with high definition voice, and for operators it's more efficient to use voice over LTE in their network. The question we are going to answer today is, are voice over LTE calls also more secure against eavesdropping? To answer this question, we need to revisit some LTE and voice over LTE basics. So you got the phone on the left side, which is connected via radio connection to the nearest base station, also called e B in LTE terms. And over this radio connections, um, the phone is connected um, with an IP connection to the subsystem called IP multimedia subsystem. The IP multimedia subsystem, also short um, IMS, manages your phone calls. It uses normal IP protocols like RTP and ZIP traffic to signaling your phone call and transport your voice traffic. I said that the phone has a normal um, radio connection to the LTE network, to the base station. This is true, but there is also something special about voice over LTE. So LTE uses the concept of bearers to ensure certain quality requirements, and this is particularly important for voice over LTE. So you can imagine that the bearer is a tunnel with a certain security uh, with a certain quality requirement, and when you got an ongoing voice over LTE calls, you got basically three bearers. The first one is a normal default bearer for the internet connection here. The second one is the IMS bearer, which contains the SIP messages directed towards the IMS, and the third bearer is very important for us today. This is the voice. Um, bearer, which contains the RTP traffic, and um, this bearer is only set up and destroyed right after the phone call. Today we are going to look into the security of this bearer. To encrypt traffic, LTE uses a stream cipher, um, which basically generates a key stream block that is then XORed towards the plain text block, and then um, which results in the cipher text. This ciphertext is sent over the air to the base station. Um, as input parameters for the encryption algorithm, for example, AS and counter mode, we basically have three, uh, five input parameters. First of all, there's a key. This key is um, the normal user traffic key used in LTE. Second, we got a count, which is an increasing sequence number for packets sent over the air. Third, which is very important, we have um, the bearer identity. This bearer identity depends on the used bearer. For example, for the internet bearer, we use bearer ID 1. For the IMS bearer, we use bearer ID 2. And for the um, voice bearer, we use bearer ID 3. We got one bit that signals if this packet is sent in uplink or downlink direction. And last but not least, we have the um, length of the key stream block. This length does not have any influence um, on the keystream itself, it just determines the length of the block. Which is important to note is that the same input parameters generate the same keystream, because everything is deterministic in here. And the same keystream can result in, the, in, in keystream reuse. And as we all know, keystream reuse is always a bad idea. So for example, if you have two ciphertext here, and XOR, these two ciphertexts are encrypted with the same keystream, and you XOR them, this would result in the XOR of two plaintext, plaintext R, XOR plaintext B. Under the assumption you know one particular plaintext, for example plaintext B here, you can XOR it, and this would result in the decryption of plaintext A. So consequently, keystream reuse allows decryption under the assumption you know one plain text. And this is something we exploit for Revolta. Because Revolta stands for reusing encrypted voice over LTE traffic 
to eavesdrop calls. So in which situation can a keystream reuse occur during a voltage setup? So basically we got three input parameters that um, are changed over time. So the direction is fixed and the length is something we cannot influence. So first of all, when is a key renewed? The key is renewed every time your phone connects to the closest space station. So when you are got um, an active radio connection. As long as this radio connection is valid, also the user plane key is valid. So when you receive now a call, your e -Note B instructs the phone to reset the account for the bearer and sets the bearer ID of the, subs or of the bearer. And the problematic case is when there is a second call, which also, um, in which also the e -Note B instructs your phone to reset the account and set the bearer ID. The question is if this bearer ID is the same as in the first call and or are they increased. So this is something we tested. Um, in total we tested 15 e -Note Bs mainly in Germany but also in South Korea. We tested a wide um, geographical distribution which is important because providers to tend, tend to deploy their um, one vendor in one particular region. And we basically find two kind of behaviors. The first behavior is that the e -Note B increases the bearer ID. Three of the tested e -Note Bs increase the bearer ID. However, we also find 12 um, e -Note Bs that do not increase the bearer ID, which results in the reusing the same, same key stream for two, kind, um, to, for two subsequent calls in one radio connection. So how does a revolter attack concept look like? So we have two parties. First of all, we have Alice on the left side and on the right side, Bob. Both perform a target first call, which we call target call. And during this target call, the attacker is already active and sniffs um, the traffic, which is over the air transmitted from Alice to the base station. And um, the aim of the revolter attack is now to decrypt this first target call. So he sniffs it and immediately after the phone call is finished, which he can detect on the radio because the bearer is teared down, the attacker calls Alice. And this call um, is particularly important because it allows us to generate the key stream, which was also used in the first call. So we know the plain text, which we sent to Alice, and we know the um, cipher text and both allows us to determine the key stream and then the key, and this particular key stream is also reused in the first target call. So we implemented all of this um, in a real world setup in a commercial network using Airscope as um, as downlink sniffer. Airscope um, is a downlink sniffer based on the open source stack for, by SRS LTE. And let me show you the video. So we have um, Alice here, and Bob here. Here we see Airscope, um, the Airscope sniffer, and we got a manuscript, manuscript here detecting the calls and recalling everything. Emma by Jane Austen, Volume 1, Chapter 3. Mr. Woodhouse was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him, and from various united causes is the cattlemen were the anointed they were the grandees of the grass kings of the kind lord of the lay barons of beef and bone they might have ridden in golden chariots had their tastes so inclined the cattlemen so we now will hear the decrypted um call phone call the first phone call Mr. Woodhouse was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him, and from various united... As you can see, we successfully decrypted um, the first phone call based on the um, key stream re recovery of the second call. And why is this possible? This is possible because of the implementation flaw by some vendors. 
And I have to admit that the specification in this case is not really clear. Basically, you got two kinds of specification. And there's a security specification which um, um, contains the security requirements and there's a protocol specification. And only the security specification um, says few sentences about the risk of keystream reuse. So we responsibly disclosed this vulnerability via the GSMA CVD program and we achieved two kind of things. First of all, um, the specification now includes test cases um, that allow um, yeah, to detect the revolt vulnerability. And the 3GPP also clarified the risk of the keystream reuse. It's now more clear to vendors and programmers that keystream reuse must be mitigated in any case. Further, um, we find um, that um, yeah, the vendors have patched the vulnerability of Revolta and the affected providers have deployed the patches. So having this said, um, I mean, we can only test a limited range and um, so we don't know um, how many providers are actually affected by this vulnerability or even have heard about the patch yet. Thus, we don't know how many vulnerable Enode Bs are still out there. Therefore, we have developed an app that allows you to test your local Enode B on the Revolta vulnerability. You can, um, yeah, all instructions and um, informations about the app, you can find on the web page www.revolta.net. And if your Enode B is vulnerable, you can share the information with us and we will contact the responsible provider with the help of the GSMA um, to fix the problem. In this way, we ensure together that the vulnerability is patched and, the, and wiped out. This is how I would like to end my talk. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions.